All right. Hey there, this is Bram Kanstein and you're listening to Bitcoin for Millennials. In this episode, I'm joined by Tuur de Meester. Tuur is a prominent Bitcoin investor, economist and early adopter who's been involved with Bitcoin since 2011. He's the founder of the Bitcoin investment fund Adamant Capital and has been a longtime proponent of Bitcoin as a sound and auditable form of money. Tuur has been one of my most influential researchers and educators in understanding Bitcoin. So I'm super grateful and excited to talk with him today. Welcome, man. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Bram. Yeah, thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, like I mentioned, like first off, I really want to say like you're one of the people whose work has been like super influential in in my understanding of of Bitcoin and especially like the economic implications, the philosophy part, Austrian economics, like all of that is not my background. And uh, yeah, you're one of the people that I learned a lot from. So I want to thank you for that because like I know how nice it is to to hear that. <laughs> But like you, when you do stuff on the internet, like you don't know how far it travels, right? So I think you, you are absolutely right. You have no idea, uh, yeah. and uh, and of course, yeah, it's 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 so cool to hear it, and um, and at the same time, it feels right because there's been people that I've learned so much from, and this is just a way to pay it forward. Yeah, exactly. I think you would agree that. Once you understand Bitcoin and you talk about it, it, it feels like an altruistic motivation compared to what the critics might say that we are pumping our bags. Right? <laughs> pumping our bags. Yeah. I mean, in some way, I feel like oftentimes it's also just a way to deal with our own insecurities about this. Like you just have to study it because it's mm. so different and it's... And so in order to feel comfortable having a lot of your future, physic like your literal personal future in invested in it, yeah. it, it requires a lot of study. And then it just helps to, to talk and, and share thoughts and, and discuss. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So before we really jump in, I, I heard before, like you discovered Bitcoin while you were traveling in Argentina. What was it that you saw and what drew you in? Yeah, I mean, it helped, of course, that I was already afraid of <laughs> what's happening in Europe. And we had the first wave of bailouts in 2008-9. And uh, the banks were just teetering, really. Like Belgium has very big banks and it's a small country. Um, so I was already scared and trying to find answers and so that background really helped to then, you know, visit my friends and see that they're mining Bitcoin and learning about it and seeing also how easy it was for them to move money in and out of the country, even though it was on financial lockdown. Like Christina Kirchner was very harsh on capital controls and things like that. So it really was a almost a perfect environment to learn about it. And uh, my friends there were very educated about it so it really helped to set the tone and, yeah. and give me motivation to dive in deeper yeah and so it took a little time but eventually i think just a few months you recommended it to people who followed your newsletter right i think bitcoin was like five dollars i think i took about what was the most six months or something i think i first learned about learn it like in, in, in spring 2011 um and then i i the newsletter only launched, I believe, the first edition was like, was maybe August or September of that year, and uh, and I was very mm. nervous because I had never, I had never owned a stock before in my life, and then here I was going to recommend people to buy stocks and <laughs> pretend that I knew what I was talking about. Uh, so it was uh, there was also some hesitation to come out and go full blast, talk about Bitcoin to this um you know completely new audience um but also for myself i needed some time to to digest it more and talk to more people uh so i think i first wrote about it um later in 2011 mm -hmm. yeah so w what was the biggest thing like like it looks like you got it right pretty pretty quick you know i think a lot of people talk about that it takes some time to learn certain things or unlearn certain things so i was wondering if there were like any specific things that you ran into or was it pretty clear cut no the thing that worried me was counterfeiting was can't people just make more of it it's digital like how how come you can't just make more of it 
And so then that's why it was so helpful to talk to a few engineers uh, early on um, to really get an education on how Bitcoin works specifically. Uh, but even then, even so, I was still hedging for quite a while. I was talking about cryptocurrencies and I said that Bitcoin is the most prominent one for the moment. And, and you know, maybe some others would come out. Um, but um, but yeah, that counterfeiting thing was big. And then if I had these, of course, we all have the same doubts come up over time, like, oh, well, can't they hard fork it? What about the miners? Can't they attack it? Like, you you know, you just go through the worries. And uh, yeah. but of course, on um, Bitcoin talk back then, the forums, that was the most important online venue to discuss Bitcoin, bitcointalk.org. Um, because it was so non-commercial, it was practically all engineers who were talking. So the level of conversation was very high and the level of people with ulterior motives and scammers was very low. So in, in some way, it was a special environment to do research in. And, 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 the, and from the economic sense, there was not a lot of understanding about where this could go. And so, um, uh, you know, like a lot of engineers who are focused on security tend to have this pessimistic mindset and that makes them so good they're constantly paranoid about what could go wrong and so i had several developers bitcoin developers stress to me like hey this is a beta product um bitcoin is in beta you 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 can't just recommend i mean they didn't give me advice on what to do but you could feel their hesitation about like oh you're going to talk about this like an investment like it's it's uh it's we're just testing here you know so yeah. so th the challenge was more on the economic side yeah and so from from those early days till now how do you think what has been the biggest shift in your perspective over 11 years like on on bitcoin it just gradually gradually learning and and believing more and more that bitcoin is is a lever that can lift the world like that can really change everything uh it is there's so many implications and of course then you also start to think about the implications of the introduction of fiat money and how that has changed everything um it really is quite incredible so the the the, the realization that there is a cultural shift going on here and um that has been it just it's it's it, 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 it there's so many things that are affected by it that you just can't wrap your head around it in in six months or in a year i don't think not that i'm yeah. not that i feel like i've i've i see it right i mean maybe there's blind spots that i have or survivor's <laughs> bias because bitcoin has been so good to me maybe i'm overlooking some serious issues with it hey there i want to ask you for a quick favor I noticed something interesting. 75% of my viewers aren't subscribed yet. Subscribing helps me grow this channel, ensuring more great content each week. So if you're enjoying our conversations on Bitcoin for Millennials, please consider hitting the subscribe button on YouTube or the follow button on your favorite podcasting app. I'm super grateful for everyone who already joined and shared their thoughts. Your feedback really keeps me going. And I want to ask you to continue doing that. I try to respond to all the comments and also the emails that I get. Uh, and DMs on Twitter, etc. So don't stop doing that. I'll keep going. Now let's get back to the conversation. Yeah. I like that you said believing. You know, I think the believing comes from the research and the scrutiny and the verification you can do yourself, right? And like, I know that and you know that, but when people be hear that you believe in it, right? Like fr from a fiat world point of view that sounds like more ideological right or someone else told you and now you believe it you know um so i, th I think it's interesting you, you said the word to leave like i mm. believe the same but it has a different meaning now at least yeah. you know uh, with regards to to bitcoin so do you feel like you're a different person because of it yeah i mean it it has helped me lean into a real optimism about the future. I, I do think uh, things are going to get a lot worse economically than before they get better. But I do believe that once we hit the bottom, we are going to be able to rebuild for real the 
the world economy. And, and of course, some countries, some people are not going to want to play ball. They're not going to want to go along. They're going to want to stay in the, the inflationary mindset and their economies will not recover. But uh, we can absolutely work with people who want to. And, and yeah, it, it has made me a lot more optimistic. Um, and because what I feared was that we were going to go into perpetual hyperinflationary cycles, like every 10 years, uh, a, a wipeout event. And then you, you can just never build up capital stock in the economy, which then you get countries that look like the developing countries in, in Latin America you know, um, and, and, and also Africa and places like that where there's just constantly inflation raging and uh, people need to be able to save before they, they have enough confidence and low time preference and comfort to build the factories, the buildings, the, the cultural institutions that will have longevity and that can uh, make life better for everyone, right? But if, if, if every time you're being stolen from, then all you yeah. care about, obviously, is just, you know, trying to survive and feeding your family and you don't think about the long term because you can't. Yeah. Yeah, it's going from consuming to building, right? Uh, the, well, I think what Safe Dean says about high time preference, not even consciously, right? People are right. forced to yeah, have exactly. a high time preference. So what do you see as kind of like key threats or or challenges for you know, more growth and, and adoption? Yeah, for Bitcoin. Well, we talked about faith. I think the threat is for people to lose faith um, and for people to think that the values, the cypherpunk values are not strong enough or not important enough to keep defending and uh, and you do that by running full nodes, by um, contributing to the Bitcoin ecosystem, by holding Bitcoin. You know, even if you just own some Bitcoin and you don't do anything else, you are contributing because you are uh, basically signaling to the world that the Bitcoin needs to have a certain value, and you 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 are contributing to keeping that a fact. And uh, there is going to be a lot of fear mongering the next uh, in this cycle probably, and 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 the next bear market probably even more. I do feel like we are now going to see governments actively resisting Bitcoin adoption, like trying to slow it down, trying to boycott, trying to trying to paint Bitcoin adoption as you know. Bitcoin as a technology as something that perhaps creates inflation, like believe it or not, I believe they're going to use Bitcoin to to blame the inflation on and say that, oh, you guys are self-promoting all the time and you're sucking the value out of the dollar and the euro uh, and that's destabilizing everything. And also they're going to say that Bitcoin is uh, used for terrorism and uh, all these criminals are using it. Um, so it's basically the counter reformation, you know, Bitcoin is like that push for, you know, breaking the shackles between the government and the money. That is what Bitcoin is. And the government is going to say, no, we want to keep it that way. Uh, not all governments. Some of them, of course, are going to embrace Bitcoin. Um, but so, yeah, it's it's very challenging because it basically means that you are a heretic. You know, if if you embrace Bitcoin, you are going to be seen as somebody yeah. who uh, is a nonconformist and is, is potentially a volatile element in society. And, and so in certain countries, you'll be less welcome. Like you will be, um, you know, life will be a bit more difficult for you. Um, and of course, we're going to do everything we can to make the experience of a Bitcoiner as, as good as possible, meaning that you can hold Bitcoin in a discreet way. Um, you can, it can always be in, in your possession, no matter where you live. Um, but it, there, it's a mental challenge, you know, and, and it's kind of a, a, a moral test as well. Like how much are you willing to, um, to put on the line to, to invest in this kind of future? And, and I'm absolutely not judging people who, who want to be more careful, depending on the countries they live in, um, uh, you know, absolutely not. But I just think that, you know, to answer your question, that I think is the biggest challenge that we are 
we are now in a stage where Bitcoin is going to go from 1 trillion to 10, 50, mm. 100 trillion. And then, you know, 1 trillion is only less than a percent of the global wealth. But once you start talking about 50 trillion, well, then that's 10 percent of global wealth. And a lot of the global wealth is actually a bubble. So maybe the real global wealth is only 200 trillion instead of 500, you know, once the bubble shrinks. So, yeah, once we start talking about $50 trillion Bitcoin, then then uh, it, you could be talking about 20, 25% of global wealth all of a sudden is is uh, invested in Bitcoin. Um, so similar, you know, to what, what we saw in the, in the Netherlands and, and Flanders with the uh, with the merchant class who became very, very wealthy because they embraced global trade and they embraced freedom of religion. Um, of course, there was, it was a, a threat to the status quo. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's a quite, I believe, a quite monumental shift in, in the, the, the culture of the world. Uh, and the difference, yeah. of course, is that it's less geographically bounded right so if you can adopt bitcoin no matter where you live if you do it discreetly you could probably have bitcoin even while living in north korea so so that is different uh, compared to previous technological revolutions yeah would you say that i don't want to I, 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 the word is harsh but i don't know another word but it it feels like a war in a sense so like mm -hmm. either it, it, it's a war of power in a sense. It's a philosophical war in a sense, you know, the power to the people kind of thing. Is, yeah, is that something you think um, people who are new to this should should understand? It's actually a word I want to be using. Likely, I will be using in my presentation in Prague uh, coming up the the conference there next month. Because it's so interesting, the world war, literally W-A-R, comes from Indo-European Werra, um, which originally meant chaos and confusion. And it's still, you see it in Dutch, right? To be in the war means I am confused. Um, and so we don't need for bullets to be flying or bombs to be dropping to be in a war-like environment. Um, I believe we're already there, definitely in Europe and in other places. There is so much confusion about what is really happening. And of course, the reality is, in many ways, we, are, we have been subject to Ponzi schemes, uh, you know, social security, um, uh, fractional reserve banking, all those things. Basically, there's a lot of empty promises and, and it, it, there will be come a time when the music stops like it's the musical chairs game and a lot of people are going to realize there's not enough chairs to sit on <clears throat> and then that's usually when the real when people get into the streets and there's more there's more pro protests and then you can have civil war or eventually governments feel like they have to find an enemy outside of the country so they start blaming uh, mm -hmm. minorities or outside outside countries and then you can have you know the classical warfare um, and to, to an extent it's already happening this civil unrest of course because of the inflation you know that that is already a way that the ponzi scheme is starting to really the pain is being felt that that's the inflation people are, yeah. are, are they're saying like I'm, I'm doing the same type of work i am a nurse i am a blue collar worker i'm a dentist whatever and yet i can no longer pay the bills like what's going on you know uh, the, so so yeah i mean i think a war is a good word uh, uh, definitely a good word to to explore uh, about what's what's happening yeah yeah I, i'm thinking about what you just said about the the threats uh you know i'm, I'm going to look up a tweet uh, while i'm talking you know the, mm -hmm. the the gaslighting that we're going to see is all well that we're already seeing is off the charts Right, I uh, I saw the Dutch National Bank, April seven. They said higher loans are um, fueling inflation, and today they said again Dutch Dutch National Bank high inflation. Uh, oh, oh no, sorry, April seven. They said higher loans 
do not fuel inflation. And today they said higher inflation is due to higher loans. <laughs> you know, so if if they don't I even think, know, I uh, think Madeleine Vos uh, tweeted that, right? Oh, yeah. Also, she there, there were some Dutch people, yeah. That, oh, that I see. I see. It. But yeah, I mean, like, no, absolutely, absolutely. They don't understand. How can you? You know, like or or well, they pretend. You know. Well, so what happens in again in this situation of war of of people of confusion and and it's it's it really goes very deep. Uh, I think people already sense basically that something is off, and they feel threatened. They feel mm -hmm. like their livelihood is threatened, their future is threatened. They don't know if they will get a pension or not even though it's still too early for them to really say it out loud, even regular people, I believe, are starting to feel something is very wrong here. Something is yeah. wrong. And what you what you get in those kind of environments is that m much more quickly, people tend to go in fight or flight, which means their, <laughs> um, their prefrontal cortex gets shut off and their reptile brain is more active. It's all about um, trying to get out of the moment, trying to get out of the situation, this kind of panicky feeling. And then that means that this simple gaslighting, when you and I look at these headlines, it's like it doesn't make any sense. Somehow, for a person who is close to fight or flight, it's, it's enough. It's okay. There's yeah. a reason the experts said uh, they don't even... Think about what it really means or what the reasoning is. It's enough that they have a little, it's like a popsicle. They have, they're soothed for a little bit. And um, and so I believe that's what we're seeing is, is that more and more people are starting to panic. And that's why populism is able to grow because people don't have bandwidth to, to go into an in-depth discussion about what's really going on because they feel so insecure, both emotionally and financially they're starting to feel more and more insecure yeah now that's also why i said you know spiritual war in a sense right your mind is obligated with this daily stuff basically and you don't you don't well if you get a little popsicle taste you know like there's no there's not really space to actually view this from a bit further than you know probably your ego that that you know, gets talked to basically. And, you know, it's of course very off, off center or not centered. If you just go along with, you know, the gaslighting that has been in front of you, I, 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 like, I, I don't know. Add, I, I just want to yeah. add before we go to the next thing is that it, there's also a cycle at work because the people who are panicking are then also, they try to prevent <laughs> getting triggered again and so they start censoring other people. They start saying like, oh, you can't say that. And so now we're mm. seeing more and more censorship happening and, and silencing. But that, of course, creates more anxiety because then exactly. you, yes. you know that you cannot ask certain questions and you won't even go there, right? So there is, a, there is almost like a, we're, we're all being uh, pushed into a state of, delusion like mm. that's we're being encouraged to go there more and more utopian delusional um yeah. and of course you know it's an unsustainable but th i think that's how it works yeah i lost you for a second oh no, but I'm um here. i was just, I'm, I'm done <laughs> yeah <laughs> um it's the it's kind of like the don't think for yourself will take care of you or something right like uh i just saw a video of these uh, demonstrations on the colleges in in america and they are like we are hungry and we are cold you should take care of us and it's so paradoxical when you look at that right it's like i'm protesting the government but please take care of me right yes. i'm like what well huh? <laughs> you know but but they are serious right so we can kind of laugh about it maybe but they are they really feel that and they're acting like that right so i think that's an illustration of what what you just uh said yeah it's 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 fascinating to see i feel a bit uh i don't know like helpless in a sense like i don't i don't know what to do about it right like you you're viewing it and i think you, you illustrated it in a great way but what do you think like what what should we do well 
I believe one <laughs> there there is some there is some good knowledge in the world of addictions and how to deal with people who are addicted and uh, I, I do believe it's accurate to to talk about people who are emotionally immature and who are both the students in your example and the government they are both acting like emotional children really and they are both codependent on each other like the the government needs the helplessness yeah. from the people and the people need the government yes. to to tell them they cannot fix it themselves and and we are going to take care of you so so there is that destructive cycle that's happening uh, which is similar to if you live in in a family with lots of addicts everybody is is um creating more and more chaos and what you need to do to survive and to just become healthy is to to create distance between yourself and that and it doesn't mean you have to necessarily leave the country you live in but um it does mean uh that you you think carefully about how to expose yourself to this uh, and, yeah. and uh, how much you can handle. And uh, uh, because if you get sucked into, for example, lots of political debates and things like that, um, uh, I think it's crazy making. And, uh, and you're more likely to actually become part of the problem because you just become so reactive and, and you feel more and more helpless than if you t make more distance and have cultivate some compassion and hang out with people who understand where you're coming from and who are willing to have just interesting conversations um, in a more cool-headed way, then it's also better. You can much better take care of yourself. And because honestly, like it, living a kind of a Bitcoin oriented life is challenging. There's lots of volatility. Like people always say, oh, Bitcoin is so volatile. But really what the volatility is just reflecting is how emotionally volatile the rest of the world is because yes. if you just buy bitcoin once and you hold it you are not contributing to volatility right it's it's the people mm -hmm. who are just oh they're jumping on the gravy train and then they're selling and panicking and they, then they're euphoric they are creating it so we and it's a it's another way that we are already confronted with the madness of the world yes. um so that's kind of my general thinking about this stuff is that I, things are going to get worse economically um, and politically, and um, we we have to think of this, or it helps at least for me to think about this as these are people who have a specific type of addiction, like they are trying to avoid looking at the reality, and they're making up a lot of stories to help them do that, and uh, it's it's kind of a crazy life to be living that way, but. It's just where we are, and it's going to last a while. Yeah. Mm. I, lo I love what you said about the volatility, right? Like, it's, uh, I've, I, I was a little later than you, but also uh, 11 years now into Bitcoin, right? Wow. Like, these, um, yeah, literally what you said, right? Like, you do the work, you understand what this is, you understand its importance, you understand the implications. And uh, I, I once saw a tweet of someone who said, like, if you even, remotely think bitcoin you know bitcoin is an experiment right it's either zero or everything that's always how i saw it and if you and then i saw a tweet once that said if you even think uh, yeah, remotely think bitcoin is not going to be zero then you should get a seat in the stadium right and that's basically when i moved way way more in but now we have this seat in the stadium right and we see the fluctuations as you mentioned and actually because we did the work and we are there we are actually improving also ourselves, like what we just talked about, right? Like you, you're getting to know yourself because you're looking at these other people that go up, you know, they, they follow the price, they go up and down and there's hysteria and the bubble pops a bit, et cetera. And you're still sitting there on your hands, right? And you're learning to follow yourself. You're learning to trust your, yourself and the feeling that you... I think created or manifested in a sense because you did the work, right? So that's, I think also in part for me, like how it changed me or improved my life is that mm -hmm. I know that I can understand, like trust myself with my diligence or my, you know, energy that I put in, into something. So I like that you said that because I think that's a good analogy, right? It's the other people that not understanding what this is yet. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, and so the weathering, the volatility is almost like an emotional gym. Like you, you go to the gym yeah. <laughs> and, and there's yeah. times when it's really hard and that's the bear market or that's the doubt or the, the even the FOMO is also challenging. Yeah. Uh, I find often that the 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 euphoria is actually the, the most difficult period for me uh, when, when there's everybody's going crazy and uh, and yeah. the, the taxi drivers are all talking about Bitcoin, that that's <laughs> often the most challenging. But so, yeah, yeah but, but I think it's great training, like you say, to like learn to know yourself and, and grow resilience um, to, uh, to just, uh, you know, build more cool stuff for the world, you <laughs> right. know, and, and, and take care of ourselves. Sorry. Yeah. Now, like it's resilience against irrationality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd say. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, if people want to mm -hmm. get into 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 Bitcoin and study it, right? What is like a very common misconception or misunderstanding that you still encounter, and how do you address it? Well, the gold bugs are interesting. People who love gold. Uh because a lot of them have known about bitcoin for 10 years now and um and of course there have been gold bugs that have adapted and are now just uh, they own bitcoin and gold but there are holdouts who are still very adamant about that bitcoin cannot work and so they are a pretty interesting source of objections against bitcoin because at least they understand yes in order for money to really work it needs to be scarce so you know at least there's a category of objections that are honestly ridiculous that you that at least they don't have anymore but they still really struggle with bitcoin in for example that it's not tangible that's difficult for them that you you yeah. cannot hold a bitcoin in your hand which is part of why it's so powerful of course uh because it means you can store it in all kinds of ways that you cannot do with gold um and also that you can verify it much more accurately and rapidly than you can do with gold, which people often don't think about. But if you have a gold coin or a gold bar, you don't know if it's real. It could be coded. You know, it could be tungsten with, with the coating around it. And then you really need some serious skill to be able to, to verify if, if it's real or not. Um, so uh so yeah like i said like th those guys have some interesting objections they often struggle also with the uh, divisibility weirdly <laughs> they think that the fact that or not everybody but there are a few who think that oh you can divide bitcoin into a million pieces one bitcoin into a million pieces that means it's not scarce <laughs> <laughs> like the pizza so, lady yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I mean, and then, of course, there's doom scenarios that they have about, yeah, what if um, all the electricity fails on the planet? Uh, there's some kind of uh, uh, Carrington event, a big solar flare, and, and all the electricity falls out. Then what are you going to do? But the fact is that as long as we have one copy of the blockchain, he's even on, could be on the surface of the moon or in a satellite somewhere, one copy of the blockchain, and we find a way to store that copy and then later recreate some computers then we can actually reboot the network uh, no matter when uh, I, and of course you know once we're in the stone age like i don't know if you'll be able to do a lot with your gold coins either mm. you know i think that the fact that like their counter argument of a solar flare <laughs> on the scale of probability is mm. very far it's probably on the other end of the spectrum then you know our argument and the probability of what if you want to sell your gold right now to someone in china when you are in the u.s at 3 a.m in the night right Absolutely. that's a more probable scenario yeah, yeah. Well, what if you, you know? lived in ukraine and war breaks out and you have a kilo exactly. of gold yeah. are you gonna are you gonna be able to take it with you across the border yeah it's i don't nonsense. know no. Like, we do know a, a bunch of stories of people who had Bitcoin and, and actually used it to get out. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, I liked. Uh, I don't know if you saw the talk by Jack Mahlers at uh, Bitcoin Atlantis. Mm. I um, haven't seen it yet. No. Yeah, for me, that's one of the best explanations I've seen in in ten years. But he said, "You can store." Yeah, uh, you know, uh, Bitcoin is stored in your head and gold is stored in your butt, he said. And then he had like this article of someone who tried to smuggle gold, right? Oh, in, yeah. the, in the in, in the plane. <laughs> you know, and 
I think, you know, it's, it's, it's a fun, silly equation, but it's just very true. You know, once you understand kind of like the metaphysical nature of Bitcoin and you are like, you know, I, I flew to Thailand a few months ago and they're like, if you have more than 10,000 US dollars equivalent, you know, fill in this form. And I thought I have more, but you don't know that. Right. And also it's in the cloud. That you, was know, it. You, don't, you don't have it physically with you. It's stored yeah. on the blockchain. You only have the key with you. Maybe. Yeah. Well, mm. yes, maybe. So if you ask me tomorrow and I say, no, like, how do you prove it? You know, like, I, I think this is the entire point for me. That's the magic in a sense, right? Like you're the only one who knows if you, if you own it. And like, that is real, that's real sovereignty in a sense. Well, and I think Jack's, Jack's way of describing it is actually also, it's not as trivial uh, what he's saying because he's describing duress scenarios. He's, he's basically saying, if it really comes down to it and you're really under stress, how are you going to store gold versus how are you going to store Bitcoin? And that's always the true test of technology is will it stand, withstand duress? That's why Bitcoin is so redundant. There's 75,000 nodes around the world. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting way to think about it. Yeah. So you mentioned uh, briefly, I think, the, the article, or well, you mentioned Reformation, but you wrote a paper called The Bitcoin Reformation. And you argue that, you know, Bitcoin, Bitcoin is, a, is a catalyzer for huge change. I think we just touched upon that, right? Like on our views on, on money, our views on and how we use money. What drives, what drives this? Can you elaborate a little bit on it? Like why does Bitcoin catalyze this this huge change in the world because it challenges the monopoly of the global monetary order um uh, the the analogy that i made was that back in the early 1500s the catholic church had a monopoly on you could call it access to heaven something like that like a peaceful afterlife that was what the church had a monopoly on a service that it was providing and the, the Protestants early on, they did not have a, a a common set of beliefs. The only thing that they thought was, well, why do we need the church to do that? Can we just on our, on our own find other ways to 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 find salvation? And uh, and then that meant that they just would stop paying the taxes to Italy. To um, and and of course it's it's complicated too because back then. The Catholic Church was instrumental also, I believe, uh, at least via their alliances with Catholic governments to uh, push the uh, the Islamic threat because there was a lot of um, a lot of warfare happening in the Mediterranean. Uh, and of course, you probably know at some point Spain got occupied. This is uh, in the early Middle Ages. Spain got almost entirely uh, occupied by uh, the, the Ottoman Empire. Um, so, so it's there is an argument to be made why the Catholics felt like it was so important that they had that power to basically maintain the peace in Europe. But anyway, like the the Dutch said, like hey, like w we want to do things differently, um, and some some Germans, of course, and and French, um, and so similarly now we are subject to a monopoly of the IMF, the you know the the global financial system basically that is working kind of similarly to the catholic church it's a hierarchical system and uh, there's a lot of separate organizations that are involved in it and that get benefits from it and in order to get financial salvation you have to yeah. work with the banks you know that that's yeah. that you are tied to this system and that means your money is in a bank and they can take it away if they want to uh, they can inflate it away. There's so much power that they have over your financial life. And Bitcoin is saying, hey, can we just do this independently? Why do we need you guys? And so in that sense, it's heresy. It is it is breaking that convention. And um, and that is historic. Yeah. You know, that, that is a once in a 500 year type event, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, I really love that um, analogy, right? Or that that illustration, the fact that a third party creates an application that you use in your daily life of which you think, you know, improves your life. 
but the issuer of the application ha has the real influence, right? Or or the real um, the real benefits. Yeah, I, I, well, yeah, I think that's kinda, great. They they there's a they lot. Control right? you with they control you. They, right? they yeah, they tell you that they're they're offering you this service, but they keep skimming. They keep taxing you in in a way that's invisible. Um, that yeah. is the the that's the thing that's uncomfortable and and wrong in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. and um, in the book you mentioned millennials. I think as the primary like adopters that that will drive the reformation because they will inherit you know more wealth from from their parents grandparents etc how do you see this progressing now i uh, i think you saw the video of the the graduation speech you know that generation is probably a bit younger that's gen z they were booing which uh, it's in, it's interesting it's an interesting conversation but like how how do you see it with regards to to millennials, of course, this is why I started this podcast. But uh, yeah, interesting. To hear interesting, your yeah, yeah. I believe millennials. Uh, w w what's your? I believe I'm I'm part of the oldest uh, slice of the millennials. I believe that if you if you were 16 years old when 9/11 happened, you are a millennial. I, uh, yeah, yeah. It's between uh, 80, 81 and 96. Okay. Ish. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was 14. I think the, yeah, yeah, I think we of course Gen Z as well, but we have the privilege of or yeah, really the luck that there is some prosperity that we saw in our younger life, like hopefully we were able to build up some savings as well. We are most likely to inherit from the boomers more more sooner than the Gen Z generation. Um and then also we grew up, not everyone, but but a bunch of us grew up experiencing things like BitTorrent, for example, where you download music and videos in a completely decentralized way. And that's, I feel pretty certain that that's something that helped me a lot in grasping me Bitcoin too. on a kind of a yes. core level. It's like, oh, it's like BitTorrent, but money. Whereas older people, they don't understand the idea that a technology exists and nobody's in charge, like that's weird to them, or especially digital technology. Um, so yeah, I think we have a lot going for us. And uh, to an extent now, it's harder to build up wealth. Of course, if you're active in the Bitcoin economy, more and more, there's more and more opportunities to do that. Um, but of course, yeah, there is going to be some some money that's going to be inherited. And, and I think that a lot of the gold bars that people inherit are going to be sold for Bitcoin. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not, I haven't studied it more, especially the, the, the difference with Gen Z, for example, I'm not, I'm not, I don't feel particularly confident about that, but I do feel the millennials have a little, have a, a just some, some extra benefit to the things yeah. that they've experienced compared to Gen X, for example. Yeah. I think like how I look at this, I, I I think I had two tweets about gold this week. One was I saw a video of a woman like emptying a bag of like gold bars, right? And then, you know, talking about also what you just said, like you need three machines to verify if it's real, right? Like how are you going to move this? How are you going to sell this in the middle of the night? Like all, all these things, it's just stupid. Like I could download the song, you know, during my 1 a.m. Uh, internet surfing uh, period or, you know, when I was 15 and I saw a song, I downloaded it instantly. I got it, right? And I don't know who hosted it. Maybe it's not even anyone in the Netherlands, right? And so I think that experience is interesting, but also the other one, like, really, I'm going to store value in a shiny rock, you know, like the, the fact that we were on the border of, you know, the physical and the digital world, and we got introduced to this digital world, right? But we still used the, in our youth stuff from from the physical world, right? I think it gives us a great perspective on, yeah, I don't know. Like, I just think like shiny rocks, you know, like it, it, it's just, it's weird. It feels so antiquated, right? And, uh, and it's 2024. Mm -hmm. right? It's just, uh, yeah, I don't know. I think it's, fascinating but confusing at the same time right but for me like gold i never even looked at gold right even when i found bitcoin and 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 started getting more into the store value stuff etc like i never looked at gold because it's just like you know cleopatra had gold like what what are we doing <laughs> you know like that's yeah. kind of yeah my, and, 
my feeling. In some way, we should thank the central bankers because they really promoted the idea that you can store monetary value on a ledger. The only thing we're saying is, why does it have to be your ledger? Yeah, this is a better ledger. Exactly. Right. So you're moving to another system that is controlled by, by no one. But yeah, I, I pasted a little... Uh, I want a tweet from you in my in my in my notion that I used to 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 prep, but this was uh, you you um, tweeted the gold price, uh, kilo of gold in Bitcoin, I think. Yeah. So you said this is a market battle of the ages. Once one Bitcoin trades over ten kilograms of gold, Bitcoin's market cap will have surpassed that of the world's above ground gold stock, right? And one of the things I find super interesting um, is. You know, if we replace gold as the most valuable asset on earth, you know, when we grew up, we learned, well, to have, you know, you, you should have gold and you should have silver, right? And if you ever buy like real forks and knives, like cut three for yourself, it should be like nice silver, you know, and th this is like the narrative, right? But we have been above silver. So that narrative was then already destroyed, right? And it's gold, Bitcoin, silver. And once we pass gold, it's the, that entire narrative that hundreds of millions of people grew up with is dead you know i i'm waiting for that day because i think that is really one of the big inflection points also in yeah kind of substantiating the value of bitcoin right like yeah yes there is more value and it's all like none of it is paper by the way right um which with gold and silver you know, is still very unclear, right? So I think it solidifies lots of the arguments that, yeah. that we now share. Yeah, and and because I, I was pretty deeply involved in the gold world before I discovered Bitcoin uh, as as a way to think about protecting against inflation. And it really has been kind of where the conservative impulse has been stored in a way, like the the the... Uh, investment conservative impulse that most people who have that they've always had some gold um and i think you're right i think that people underestimate the psychological power that gold still has in this world and it's so interesting that the resistance that we're seeing uh just price technically actually in 2021 and 2022 we we were very, very close to one kilo of gold in Bitcoin. And then we went to it again. And then we went down. And now we're again, even though the dollar price has been higher because gold has gone up as well, we're basically again pushing yeah. against the limit of one kilo of gold per Bitcoin. And I think it's probably not a coincidence. There is something psychological similar to there's been dollar barriers as well, where there is resistance at one dollar and 10 and 100 and 1,000 because people... Think like, oh, but Bitcoin cannot be worth more than that. And so once we go above a kilo, then the next target is 10 kilo, which is literally what you're saying, the parity with gold. It means Bitcoin is worth as much as gold once we hit 10 yeah. kilo. Um, and I think you're right. If we go above 10 kilo, it's going to be pretty monumental. It's, it's going to, because all the conservative people will then have to, deal with bitcoin they can no longer say yes. oh it's the little brother and who cares it's like no 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 this is bigger than gold now in 20 years or however long it's going to take yeah well you can flip the delusional script on the gold box right <laughs> you know because then more people trust bitcoin at that point than than gold to store their value yeah. right yeah i, I, I think I, i'll I, always i'll always have some some kind words for gold bugs no matter if they hate bitcoin because they they still really care about scarcity and and mm -hmm. generally you know don't spend more than you have and those kind of things so yeah. i i i i don't know i i will always have some sympathy um and of course you know it's it's it, there is some merit in general to being a little bit conservative and not just jumping on board of a new train if it's only 15 years old. Like they they are right to say gold has been around for 6,000 years. Bitcoin is 15 years old. You know, let's, we need yeah. time to, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't judge anyone I, for, for I, waiting. I, no, me neither. I, I, what I just meant with like, mm -hmm. you know, shiny rocks, like that is for me. Like mm -hmm. I grew up yeah, yeah. on the internet, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. One side question when you said like, yes, it's it's just 15 years old, right? I think if you see the comparison, you know, the, the table between Bitcoin and gold, right? The only thing which is 
more negative on the Bitcoin side than gold is like the the age, right? They say, you know, and and then from age people derive um, trust. Then I'm I'm assuming. Would you say that something like that having, right, where we basically see um, or we kind of like celebrate that, you know, the monetary policy of the protocol is still enforced and adopted, right? Because we, dro- we dropped the, the block rewards. Would you say that that like repeating event slash transparency would actually, should actually like speed up the time, if that makes sense, right? It's not 15 years. Like it, it's something that's added to the quality of Bitcoin, something that we do not have with gold, right? Like the, the 2% inflation number for gold is a, it's not a scientific number. It's not a proven number, right? Nobody, nobody can really check it. And when there's asteroid mining, you know, then, then that narrative also dies, right? So yeah, I just want to ask your, your thoughts on that because for me, that is something that adds to Bitcoin that nothing else has, basically. Does that make sense? <laughs> no, yeah, it makes sense. Uh, that that it's so elegant, you know, to have one event every four years to to cut the inflation in half. Because he could have done it in a different way, that it was more a smooth curve. Um, but I I find it, yeah, it's fascinating. It's really elegant, and it's almost like a global PR event. It advertises that hey, like. Yeah. Bitcoin is just cutting That's it in what half I mean. once more. Yeah. We just we keep trucking. Yeah. It's 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 like the solar eclipse. Like it's predicted, and then it happens. It's like oh my god, this is real. Uh, it's it's so powerful in that sense. Um, yeah, I, um, I, I you're right. Gold doesn't have that. And actually, when gold becomes more popular, the inflation goes up because the price exactly. goes up, so it's more profitable to mine. And you saw that in the 1850s, there was a, a valuation boom. And also there was a mining boom in the 1930s because the gold price went up a lot. Um, so yeah, it's kind of the opposite with Bitcoin where it's so inert. It doesn't care about the price at all. It's, it's just going to yeah. keep doing what it does. Very powerful. Yeah, I agree. It, it's, it sets it apart. Yeah. So from from like a philosophical standpoint, mm-hmm. how how do you look at like the incentives in Bitcoin game theory you touched upon before and like how that influences our our behavior? Oh, you mean as with regards to for example time preference? Yeah, exactly. Like what what how, how do you see like those elements influence our our life? I think the Austrians just have fantastic methodology there because people tend to overcomplicate things usually when they think about, oh, economic laws and, and how this influences that and it's all very abstract and maybe you need formulas and stuff. But what the Austrians say is that human action has certain laws and, and incentives that work for the individual create effects on a global scale just because uh and and so you can basically imagine situations that are very very small and easy to to put in your mind like a robinson cruise who's stranded on an island or just a family living together in a house and then you change one variable and you you look what happens so it's actually really accurate to say your story or my story you know how did bitcoin change my life well it allowed me to not to 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 appreciate the value of saving my money uh, a lot more than when I was living in a fiat world where my savings were expressed in euros and they kept lowering in value over time. Because in Bitcoin, every every year on average it goes up how, however much, like one hundred and fifteen percent on average or something. Yeah. So you are very much incentivized to wait. You just wait and wait and you cultivate patience. And and, uh, and, and, and there's so many implications from that. A low time preference society is a society that builds cathedrals that are built over 200, 300 years. Um, a low time preference society is a society that um, produces artists like uh, Beethoven and Bach and and. and and um and 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 there is a certain spiritual element as well i believe where where society tends to appreciate 
things that are universal and eternal in, in, a, in a more profound way than a society that is always trying to survive because tomorrow, who knows, they might steal our, all our money again. They might do another stimulus that um, you saw. If you talk to business owners about COVID, it was so disruptive. You know, even the stimulus event was disruptive because then you are chasing the subsidies and you forget about your customers and it, it just... It's so confusing, and uh, and that's what Mises also says, is that interventionism makes economic calculations so difficult, almost impossible. And the opposite is just a free market with hard money. That is actually when the economic machine can does, it, does its best work and uh, creates prosperity for, for everybody. So, yeah, the, I mean, that's something to, you know, you can write books and books about it, but the, the core element is, is the time preference uh, change like it, it it helps you breathe and and think long term yeah yeah you said eternal i like that you know like mm -hmm. the the then i think like fiat money is ephemeral right it's fleeting yeah. and yeah. everything you do with it is fleeting and all the the, the the time you spend on it is fleeting it's not stored right like i think i think that's a well, one thing, for example, That's that true. I notice all the time now, if I walk around, is I see the difference between, like, I went to a little sculpture park, and uh, and so there were a few sculptures that were made out of stone, and uh, and others that were made out of, like, flimsy metal, or not even that, like, some kind of other material, and you could already see, after it was 10 years old, this park, and you could already see a, a bunch of the sculptures were starting to deteriorate, just um, that apparently those artists, I don't know if they didn't care or they didn't have the money to actually, you know, create art that would last, you know, and, and I think you see it in, I'm sure in Europe as well, with the difference between art that was created in the 1800s uh, that is still beautiful today and then art that was put there 20 years ago that's already falling apart. Yeah. I, sometimes I go uh, to Belgium, known to you, obviously. And then when I drive around, sometimes I think, when was this nice? Mm. You know, when this was made. But I, I, in Belgium, I think, like, I cannot really even see, like, when something was made, right? But sometimes I think, like, when was this nice, right? Is there no one who, who drives here and thinks, like, hmm, maybe, maybe we should upgrade this, right? Or, um, you know, demolish it and put in something new or make it better or whatever, right? Like, it's just, it's very out there. I would say, right? And then, of course, there's, there's, there's places also in Belgium, you know, where there are actual things from two, three, four hundred years ago. I mean, some, something like uh, Bruges is amazing, right? Um, but yeah, that's, it's so interesting that uh, it's kind of like quality over quantity or something. Also, well, yeah, I mean, it's also, it just, who who gets to be powerful in a fiat world? It's people that have short time preference, and who who know how to play the political game and how to how to be close to where the money comes out, where it's being produced, and um, and that's you know means you have to be around psychopaths, and it means you have to be in a very toxic environment. So so people that have low time preference, even in a fiat world, they will be more private more entrepreneurial uh away yeah. from politics um and so yeah that it's that's why the taxes like Millet says like they just there's no limit to how much taxes socialists will will want it, it's infinite so that's why yeah. the tax pressure in belgium i believe it's 52 percent now it's like every dollar that's being produced uh is is more than half of it is taxed um just yeah, and so that's why there's no money to maintain all the beautiful buildings and and build new stuff. Um, it's it's uh, it's a tragedy. People people die from this stuff, you know, because it, it, it also goes into healthcare and all kinds of things. It's yeah. uh, it's well, that's one of the things that ec economics taught me is is to to see the alternative world in your mind's eye. To look at like you're saying, you're you know driving through Belgium is like, what if there was no fiat money a hundred years ago and they stayed on a gold standard or hard money somehow, how would this country look like? And it's, it exactly. would be night and day. You, you cannot even imagine yeah. the, the yeah. wealth and the beauty, I believe. Yeah. It's, it's funny when people say like, um, you know, if, if the whole purpose of Bitcoin is to hold it, nothing will ever happen. 
you know, and my answer to that is always, no, you get to live your life also together with other people. It's not the lonely thing, right? mm. but you get to live your life. You're, you get the freedom back that is now also spiritually taken from you, right? Like how can you come up with a new cathedral if you're worried about getting dinner tonight? Yeah. You know, like that, even if you're a stonemason, <laughs> you know, you don't have time for that literally. Yeah. And, and we like to kind of, you know, poo poo or look down on, on, uh, centuries ago how people lived and everybody was dirt poor and but in some ways especially up to the 1500s there was more stability uh for people if you think about the last hundred years we had two world wars we had uh several drastic devaluations that happened um but like just look at the paintings you know like look at Bruegel exactly. and, and 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 Rembrandt and and Franz Hals and all those people like that that was in many ways, a beautiful life that people had. It doesn't mean that it wasn't, it wasn't maybe as long as ours, but um, I don't think it's, you know, I think it might be a little arrogant to just assume we have it better now uh, in, in a, in a kind of a social sense. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. So I want to ask you two more things before, mm -hmm. before we wrap up Yeah, about global adoption and game theory. Do you have any thoughts on like countries or regions that you think would have the greatest potential to to adopt Bitcoin or contribute to to its development? Well, if you follow my tweets, you can probably already guess. I'm gonna at least mention uh, Texas and Argentina. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think. I mean, honestly, I am more gradually more impressed by by El Salvador as well. Although I still don't know if I understand the culture very well I, I just don't know how how sustainable these changes are and um and how for example rule of law i think is very important and very very difficult to to change once a certain system of of courts and and and, and um juries and lawyers and uh, once that's put in place it's very resistant to change um and so yeah, so so I'm 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 very bullish on on Latin America in general. I, I although the Americas have the advantage that it's a it's a continent of immigrants, and Europe does not have that advantage. Um, we we do have immigrants, but they were not bootstrapped. A lot of them have been attracted by giving um, subsidies and and uh, welfare checks and those kind of things, and that's a different type of person that you attract versus uh, just saying you can come here and make something, but we're not going to give you any money. And that's what yeah. I think the Americas is. So so I think Asia has the challenge of this consensus culture. Like they, they like to agree on a lot of things and, uh, and that can create to lead to a lot of volatility in times of change. You know, if, if there's a regime change needed or there's a big technological revolution that changes a lot of variables, then I think uh, you have the risk of warfare and those kind of things um, and, and, and populism. So, yeah, I'm very, very bullish on the Americas. Of course, Canada is, is worrisome. I think the U.S. is also tricky. You know, there's a lot of uh, a lot of collectivism there, too. I think the dollar is there's if you think about the federal government, for example, three million people are directly employed by the federal government, 15 million contractors, apparently, or 12 million. I'm not sure. Wow. So that's that's a lot of people whose paychecks are de dependent on the value of the U.S. dollar and people who could potentially get very angry if if there is a change in, in the, the monetary system. So yeah, that remains to be seen. Um, um, but so, and and in Europe, I think on the edges, it'll be interesting. You know, there's always little countries. Uh, you know, of course, it could be a Switzerland or a Monaco or a, um, who knows, maybe a Portugal. Like a, I think that th these figures that we're now seeing, like a Millet and um, Bukele, that is just the beginning. Like we are going to see more and more new political figures that embody the bitcoin spirit in some way and of course in some countries it'll be just like with the reformation you know some some people 
took the word Protestant and they made something crazy out of it. Like, you know, I honestly, maybe I'm, people will be offended by this, but I think in, in Germany, for example, the Protestantism was pretty extreme there. So they kind of, instead of saying, oh, we, we, uh, we embrace freedom of religion, they say, no, 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 we have a new system and a new monopoly and this is how it is. So I definitely don't want to say a blank check for all the future presidents who are pro bitcoin like some of them are going to be crazy uh yeah. but at least i there is going to be a bitcoin vote i believe that that is going to shake things up um yeah yeah well and i think also uh two two episodes back if you didn't see it check it out i have maya parbu she's going to be a presidential candidate in suriname uh, mm, in mm. may 2025 um, again like africa as well you know africa could make an enormous leap because they have been financially enslaved for such a long time yeah hmm. a suriname is south america oh wait wait, wait. Uh, why am i uh, Where sorry is suriname? i said suriname. Uh, suriname above brazil suriname wait why am i so confused <laughs> i i that's uh, that's very uh yeah, embarrassing because i on I the study... top oh you're right next to guiana yeah yeah, yeah. oh oh i see but we I talked about yeah, I, gotcha. I talked about it with her and uh, I said, you know, I think I think you have more than a nation behind you. Right. I think that is so interesting that that this, um, you know, you, you you are probably known with the Balaji mm -hmm. network state idea. Right. I, you know, Bitcoin is a network state in yeah. that sense. So anything that she would share that is interesting, like it's going to be super em amplified versus, you know, I don't know, the random <laughs> opponent that she will have. You know, that is totally not in, into Bitcoin. Um, so I think that's going to be just super interesting. Uh, su super well, interesting similar to, to watch. The, his the history of the United States where the, the places that were friendly to the crazy duchies who just wanted to trade, you know, and who maybe not because there were some very religious colonies in the early days, very, you know, very specific religious colonies. And those became less prosperous than, for example, New Amsterdam, where it was just about trade and freedom. Um, and so I think similarly in Latin America, it just remains to be seen, like wherever freedom is welcome, that's where the money and the, the economic opportunities is going to flow towards. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, I do think there's an element too with energy where, where countries that have a lot of untapped stranded energy, they will, of course, love to get involved with mining. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think Suriname takes a lot of boxes, actually, also with this energy part. But also, I learned, I thought there were more people, but it's only 600,000 people, but the country yeah. is huge. Right? right. So it's not that many people to convince actually sure right? of, of yeah, it's of like iceland is three hundred thousand. yeah exactly yeah mm. so yeah you can yeah. you can, like small countries can be surprisingly fast in changing things and, and making things happen yeah um, by think, the way i, I noticed so I, I was confusing it with senegal that's why i was so confused. oh yeah <laughs> mm. so i think yeah you you argued a lot also currently you know bitcoin is very undervalued considering how you see it as like a long-term store of value. Where do you see Bitcoin going in the next five, 10 years in terms of price, if you want to say price, but like adoption, overall impact? Yeah, I think that this, we are now in finally in the 1995 moment uh, compared to, if you compare Bitcoin to the internet adoption, 1995 Bitcoin, uh, internet adoption was around, 9% in the US. Um, and I think that's about where Bitcoin is probably, at least in, in developing countries, but um, developed countries, but maybe even globally, that that um, people are really starting to have some exposure to Bitcoin. And so that means I think from here will accelerate, there'll be more and more on ramps, like the ETF is like, that is like the Windows 1995 operating system. It just, you mm. know, just, you just push a button and you go online. Um, so I think this cycle is huge and even in, within this cycle, I think we could go above $200,000. Uh, we could go as high as 600,000. Uh, so that means for the next two, three years, basically. Uh, and then after I do think, like I said, I think governments feel very threatened and so there's going to be backlash. Um, so things are going to get interesting. Um, 
maybe we'll we'll have countries that try to make central banks of Bitcoin. They will like take an exchange and nationalize it or something like that. Um, so that's why I always caution people to to try and store your own Bitcoin and not not just go ahead with these ETFs and stuff because that's the low yeah. hanging fruit. Like that's very easy to that's very easy to dominate. Um, but yeah, yeah, very I'm very very bullish uh, for the Bitcoin price. This is just the early early days of a new bull market. I think. Yeah, I think what what you mentioned before, you know, like we are in a one in five hundred year paradigm shift. And it's something I share a lot with people that the fact that we are living in that moment is so mind blowing, actually, that you just dismiss it. Right. But I think we should keep repeating that we are actually there and that you can participate. Although the finance guys have figured it out, you know, you can still, you can still participate. And yeah, it's just, it, it, it's going to be fascinating to see where it goes. And I think, you know, we have our seats in the stadium. This is kind of how I see it, right? Like we have the seats in the stadium and we're watching. And for me, it kind of became like entertaining because I know what I know, right? And and there are some unknown unknowns, right? You never know what governments could do, or, you know, or the examples that you give. But but I know I know that I'm sitting and I'm sitting there solidly, you know, and it's just it's it's actually i'm totally captivated by it right like this is what i think about every every day and it's entertaining like i want to see this right and and the, like all the memes of you know the most uh, entertaining outcome is the most likely like i believe that you mm. know like we're we're gonna see that and and even when we have a drawdown after this bull run like there's it's going to be a bigger group of people that understand what that is and it's it's you know it's it's growing person by person and so yeah it's uh, just better technology yeah, that's why it's going to get adopted about it's the future just, it's just better yeah exactly <laughs> yeah <laughs> like do you want to stick with horses or you know swords instead of gunpowder like what are you talking about and also that i think is a good way to put that you know one in 500 year paradigm thing in perspective like the i think the gunpowder example is great because you know, everyone understands that, right? Okay, so you have swords, I adopt gunpowder. What do you think is going to happen? You know, and, and and like, yeah, well, I hope that triggers enough people. <laughs> I want to be mindful of your time, but I, I want to ask you my last question that I ask everyone. And that's, uh, what's a core belief that you will never let go? Well, well, it's, I mean, on the verge of, the first thing that came to mind is just believing that the truth is, real like the truth is out there and we we can it's like the x-files the truth is out there um (laughs) but know that we we can actually identify truth as human beings and uh, and if we we work at it we can actually surprisingly learn a lot of things about the world and about ourselves and uh and that is to me really the catalyst of so much optimism and hope because it also means if the truth is real, then it's something universal. And then we can all connect to that and then connect to each other uh, via that means. So we don't have to be isolated and living in our own delusions. We can actually, um, yeah, just all be connected and, 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 uh, and, and, and collaborate and, and, and make this into a wonderful uh, existence. That, that was the first thing that came to mind. Love that. I think that's mm. a perfect, perfect ending. Well, Wait, before thanks, you man. close, thanks. can I just say, I, I think you're um, you're a really great host. I think you ask great questions and it's very obvious that you you are very well versed in in the Bitcoin, uh, you know, universe. And um, and so I think you do your listeners a, a great service. I, I'm, uh, I'm definitely going to check out some of your content. Thanks so much. Like uh, that. Uh, I, I don't think you know what that means for me, but I think I really, really appreciate that. And um, yeah, man, I want to thank you for your time and maybe we can do this again in the future. And uh, yeah, let's stay in touch. I'll make sure to link to your profiles and stuff so people can follow you. And uh, yeah, man, thanks again. My pleasure. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, it would be amazing if you could rate, review and subscribe on the podcast platform of your choice. It will help us educate more millennials on the importance of Bitcoin. You can follow and connect with me on Twitter. I'm Bramke, that's at B-R-A-M-K. And if you are or know someone who has an interesting perspective on Bitcoin that's worth sharing, hit me up. 
I read and reply to every single message. I appreciate your support and hope you'll be here for the next episode. Thanks for listening. Bye.